church why don't we stand all across this house is anybody happy to be in the house of the lord on a beautiful sunday morning let's lift up the name of jesus together thank you god for this opportunity that we can come into this place this place of liberty and victory and safety this place with our family our friends god thank you thank you for your goodness jesus thank you for your mercy god Thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We've come for you today, Jesus. We bless your name today, Jesus. Oh, help me sing today.
Why don't we call on that great name? Come on, say the name. There's no other name. Oh, Jesus. Things begin to happen when you say the name. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. There are many needs represented here tonight that go beyond these four walls. Sister Garcia needs prayer. She is sick in her body, so we need to take her before the Lord today. I wonder if there's anybody else that has a need here today. I wonder if you could just lift your hand. Yeah. Well, let me encourage you. Jesus is here. The Bible speaks and tells us of about, of, about a man who was blind, but he made up in his mind that today was going to be the last day he was blind. When he heard that Jesus was in the area. And I just want to tell you, the Bible says that when he began to cry out, it says that Jesus stood still. And I want to know, if, do you have the faith to get God's attention today? Because he's here to meet your need. I want to tell you, he's here. I feel him in this place right now. Everybody, I saw a lot of hands go up. If you have a need in this house, why don't you step out in faith saying, God, today is the day and I'm going to get your attention today, God. Come on, that's it. Let your faith be ignited and believe God. Because we believe when you call on that great name, things begin to change. Come on, there's time. Make room. Make room in the altar right now. Come on, that's it. 
Now when you come down here, lift your hands. The elders of the church are going to pray. God, in the name of Jesus, we have no other God but you. There is none like you and none beside you. Today we call on your great name. Touch Sister Garcia in her body right now, God. There are so many needs here today that we know that you are a God of abundance. You are a God of not just enough, but you are a God of abundance, a God of victory, a God of miracles. God, right now, bring down walls, Lord. Begin to break chains, God. Open blind eyes, Jesus. Unstop deaf ears, oh God. We're believing that the lame will walk again, God. That broken marriages will be healed, God. That purpose and destiny will be in this house, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, stir the waters of baptism, oh God. And be glorified in this place by filling somebody with the power of the Holy Ghost. We believe you for it. We thank you for it. All across this house, let's put our hands together. Let's clap as unto the Lord. Come on, let your clap be a resounding praise in the room. Let it be a clap of victory. As you're clapping your hands, why don't you shout with a voice of triumph?
the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the ever victorious one. He's never lost to battle. Oh, come on. I think we can do better than that this morning. Come on, let's lift him up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. I don't know about you, but I like that song. The title of that song is Faith Over Fear. How many of you have been scared in your life? Amen. I've been afraid in my life before. I have been afraid for my life before. Brother Hicks, there was a time when I knew if Bishop took the bass off, I was afeared for my life. That's, lingo, that's, that's legal language. They say if you ever have to use deadly force, that's you're supposed to say, I am afeared for my life. If Bishop took the bass off, I was afeared for my life. I knew the judgment of God was coming. Now, that song does not say that you have faith instead of fear. Now, that's different. If you have faith instead of fear, you have faith and you're not afraid. we just saying that we're going to choose faith over fear. That's a whole nother thing. David said, though, an host encamp against me. David chose faith over fear. So guess what? If you're afraid of something in your life this morning, choose faith. That's not saying you're not scared. That's saying I'm choosing to believe God even when I'm scared. Yea, though I walk through the valley, not when I walk around the valley, when I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. God's with you this morning. We have a couple of announcements, and we're going to get to them lest I continue to preach. First announcement is there is an enchilada dinner following the service tonight. All of the proceeds from this enchilada dinner go to help pay for Vacation Bible School, which is just a few weeks away. If you have a child or know of a child and you would like to get them enrolled in Christian Growth Center's Vacation Bible School, you need to touch base with Sister Mediana immediately. Touch base with Sister Mediana her and her team are lining out all the details on how you can enroll your children into Vacation Bible School. It's going to be an exciting time this year, and it's just a few weeks away. So once again, if you want to enroll your children, please get with Sister Mediana, and she can line you out and how to do that. So immediately following the service tonight, there is an enchilada dinner. It is $7 per plate and a dollar extra for the drink. Every bit of this money goes to help pay for that so the kids can have a wonderful time. And I'm believing the Holy Ghost is going to fall on vacation Bible school. And we're going to have some children get the Holy Ghost because that's what it's all about. Amen, Christian Growth Center. Also, for all the young people, there is a refuel fellowship going on this Friday evening. Listen, this is exciting stuff. It's top secret right now. It will be released in the next few days. But we are going to have an absolute blast this Friday. So if you consider yourself a young person, you need to figure out what is going on and be there. We're going to have a wonderful time. And then how many young people are excited about going to peak? Come on. Okay. How many of you are not excited about going to peak? All right. Let's try this again. How many of you that are going to peak are excited about going to peak? All right. It's a little bit better. So not tonight. I know this is a ways out. This is not tonight. But next Sunday night, we're going to have a meeting with all of the parents of the children that are going, all of the young people that are going, all of the chaperones that are going. So if you have children going to peak, we need you in that meeting. If you are going to peak, we need you in that meeting. And if you are a chaperone of those going to peak, we need you in that meeting. We're going to go over... Basically, all of the final details, answer out any questions, iron out any last things that we need to iron out so we're all on the same page when we leave next week to head to peak. Now, with all the announcements out of the way, 
We are absolutely delighted to have each and every one of you in the house. Why don't you reach across the aisle, shake someone's hand, welcome them to the house of God this Sunday morning. the Lord, everybody. As you're getting your tithe and offering ready, I do have one more announcement. There is some confusion on our men's camp out and the date moved several times. So I just want to clarify that the dates are August 17th, 18th, and 19th. Okay, we had to move it because of an ITW and then we moved it and then there was a wedding that next date that we checked and so we moved it again so i hope that doesn't cause any of the gentlemen conflicts with your schedule or dates you requested off my apologies but it is august 17th 18th to 19th at needle creek reservoir and we're hoping to have a special guest with us it's gonna be a great time of fellowship and renewal and if you have any questions feel free to come talk to us after service let's put our scripture up how many are praying for the payoff of our building Amen. God is going to do it in Jesus' name. He's going to give us victory over that debt devil. Amen. Praise God. Let's read together. But the land whither you go to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. 
a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Amen. Let's bring it this morning.
Sometimes people crack me up. Their favorite country and western star, they'll pay 300 bucks for a ticket, spend another 500 bucks on booze. Oh, yeah, you can spend money on booze real fast. I, I, we were at the, we were at, uh, now if y'all in a hurry, God bless you. You're not in a hurry at your rock concerts and your ball games. People will be, they'll be tailgating for five hours before the ball game starts. Hey, you worship your God your way, I worship my God this way. This is how I worship my God. And uh, I was at a restaurant the other day and I looked at the drink deal and there was a drink. There was a drink that was 10 bucks. Brothers and sisters, I can make a lot of iced tea for ten dollars. And they'll spend five hundred bucks on booze. And they'll get hammered. And they'll dance and carry on. They get a little tipsy and they can't dance. You've heard that story, white boys can't jump. Well, a lot of people can't dance. But they get drunk, they think they can. And then come to church and sit like a bump on a dill pickle. And their life's a wreck, their marriage is a wreck, they're full of addictions, they're full of bitterness and hatred. You ought to try having church our way. You ought to try releasing all of that and letting the Holy Ghost move in your life. And see what Jesus will do when you get the joy of the Lord down in your heart. Woo! The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 12, the Lord prophesied and said, Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. He didn't say, therefore, with education, therefore, with intellect, therefore, with money, therefore, with prestige, therefore, with status. That's not what he said. 
He said, joy is the bucket of salvation. If you want salvation in your life, you got to get the bucket of joy. You got to turn the power of the joy of the Lord loose in your life. Woo! And I feel that joy in this house today. Hallelujah. Praise God. Woo! Why don't you turn to somebody you don't know real well and smile real big at them and say, I got the joy of the Lord. Do you? Come on now. Come on, get a little courage. Look at somebody you don't know real well. Smile real big. Say, I got the joy of the Lord. Do you? I have a set of keys up here. They're not the keys to the kingdom. Looks like they're the keys to somebody's house. I'll sell them for a hundred bucks for the building fund right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if they're your keys, are they yours, brother? Oh, somebody. I did that just so I could see Brother Lewis today. See that wonderful smile on his face. Hallelujah. <laughs> are you feeling good as I am this morning? Praise God. I want, uh, if you would please, I would like for you to turn with me to the book of St. John chapter 6. Hallelujah. And... Uh, Trying to see what time it is. If we can be out of here by 3 o'clock, that would make it just right for me to eat. <laughs> Praise God. Some of you haven't seen you smile all morning. You're worrying me. You, obviously, I'm going to be done before 3 because I'm going to eat something. Look at there. I just broke a nail. How did I do that? If I weren't in front of you all, I'd just bite it off. But i got to be mannerly here. See, when you get a little bit drunk on the Holy Ghost, ain't no telling what you'll say. In fact, that's the command of the Apostle Paul. He said, don't be filled with strong drink, wherein you're lost. That's what that Greek word there is means. Strong drink will cause you to be lost. But he said, be filled with the Spirit. It's all right to get drunk on the Holy Ghost. Praise God. St. John chapter 6 verse number 35 reads like this. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. Now, that's quite a statement. I am the bread of life. He told another lady, and we'll talk about this here in a minute, that if you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. Hunger and thirst are two of the vital signs of life. You know you're dying when you no longer want to eat and you no longer want to drink. And he said, if you come unto me and you eat this bread, you will never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Now, I want to drop down to verse number 41 and show you the, the response of his crowd. When he told them this, it's this, the same story, the same account, and his response from the crowd was they murmured at him. They were angry with him. Because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Now, I'll tell you right up front what he's telling them is he was the manna. He's telling them, I was the manna that your fathers and your grandfathers and your great-grandfathers ate in the wilderness. And they were mad at him for saying that. So, I want to preach or teach or whatever God leads us to do on this subject this morning. 
the bread of heaven. Now, last week I taught on the blood. And is there a blood shortage this week? I want to talk about the bread from heaven. Whether you know it or not, I am preaching doctrine. Because the Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, Preach the doctrine. For in doing so, thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. So before we get into this this morning, I would ask that you would put your Bibles down. The Holy Ghost is already here. We've been worshiping the Lord. And let's, go, let's ask God to illuminate our eyes, to open our ears, to hear what the Spirit would say. God, these are your people. They're wonderful people. You brought them here today, and you, you love them. And God, they have been so faithful that they have come here because they are hungry to hear your word. God, I ask you that you would help me not to waste their time, but let me speak as the oracle of God into their life that they would find sustenance and rest for their weary souls and would leave this place changed and encouraged and full of faith and the power of the gospel in their life, God, for the victories and the purpose that you have called them created them for oh God we believe you for all of this and we ask it and every, excuse me everybody said in Jesus name praise God you may be seated this scripture in John actually all scriptures are very very interesting to me uh, before I go there I do want to acknowledge our guests and our visitors I'm so good to see Sister Frankie home. We've missed her. Glad she's back. And Sister Frankie, you did introduce me to this gentleman, and I cannot remember your name, sir, and I'm so sorry I'm the world's worst at names. Mark, so thrilled that you came to be with us today, sir. God bless you. And if there are others, if I missed you, it's good to have Sister Pound's family with us. They look real good here. We're so glad when they show up. Amen. I know Sister Pound is happy they're here. And, uh, and others, if, you're, if this is your first time here and I missed you, please, uh, please do not charge that to my heart. Just charge it to my ADHD that is sometimes can be all over the place. And I can't blame it on a donut because Sister Carla gave me a donut this morning. So I'm in trouble. Praise God. Uh, it's interesting to look at this verse in St. John chapter 40, or chapter 6, excuse me, verse 41. Because the Bible is actually allowing us into this scenario. It's actually part of the same scenario in which Jesus tells them, I am the bread of life which cometh down from heaven. And it becomes even more interesting because Christ implies that this bread has the ability to actually give life. This bread is good stuff. Now, there is an all-out campaign against bread. You know, now if you're if you're uh, gluten free and you're allergic to gluten, we get that. But 99% of America is not allergic to gluten. Man, I've already I'm I'm already in a controversy. Gluten's been around since it grew in the Garden of Eden, and all of a sudden it's terrible. Marijuana's okay, but gluten is terrible. Well, I'm really getting controversial now, aren't I? <laughs> you ought to see the looks I'm getting right now from some people. I'd really like to see what I'm getting online. Hey, post some emojis or whatever those things are for Brother Pound to look at. 
Is he up there? There he is. We try to hide all that stuff so it doesn't distract us from worshiping God. Uh, this bread gives life. And uh, Jesus makes this powerful statement. He that comes to me shall never hunger. Now, let's explain that because I don't believe anybody can just eat one time and never have to eat again. That would take all of the joy out of being a human being. Some people eat to live. I live to eat. I'm like Gruffy Bear. Some of you don't know who Gruffy Bear is. He, he wrote a little song that said, I love to eat. And some of you do too, judging by how we are very similar. <laughs> hey, I never made it a bad thing to be... Uh, well, one time my wife told me, you's not fat, you's fluffy. <laughs> I like to go to the Philippines and the Vietnam and Africa because when you're chubby like I am, they think that's a sign of wealth. Over here I'm just a chubby little guy, but over there I'm a wealthy man. I'm going to get a smile out of some of you some way or another today. Jesus makes a powerful statement. He that cometh unto me shall never hunger. Now, obviously, he's not just talking about eating one time. And we know this because the very way that God created us, who it was Jesus, we just didn't know him back then because he didn't have a human body back then. He was a spirit. And then he created the human body. We know that because the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 that great is the mystery of godliness. The mystery of godliness is not that God is three different people. That's idolatry. The mystery is that God became a human being. God was manifest in the flesh. That's how the Bible reads. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say God's three different people. It said that this great God manifested himself and became a man. And, and so this God that created us, he didn't create us to eat one time. He created us that we constantly have to eat to maintain life and energy and sentiency. That means you got some intelligence. And so the very way that he, he created us requires that we eat often. This is the very nature of life. For life to exist, it must be fed. For life to exist, it must drink. It has to have water. All of these scientists that are trying to find life on another planet, good luck. Uh, if you believe in aliens, I got a bridge out here on the Fountain River. I'll sell you real cheap. And, uh, man, I'm just hitting all the points today. When you study the Bible, you realize that the earth is made for a specific reason. All of the universe is focused on what God is doing here on the earth. Now that, you say, well, you really have a high opinion of humanity. No, I have a high opinion of my God. I have a very high opinion of my God. And he creates life, and it has to have water to live. And that's the following part of his pedagogue in this particular verse. He that believeth in me shall not only ever hunger, but he shall never thirst again if you believe on him. That's what he's saying in St. John chapter 6. Now, it's in the same continuity, and we'll talk about this here in a little bit, that he moves right into chapter 7. Remember, there were no chapters in the Bible till 500 years after the Bible was written. And the reason why they added the chapters and verses is so that you could find particular things in the Bible that you needed to redress over and over and over to reinforce our faith. 
And I don't think that it is just a one-time trip to the well. He actually tells the lady at the well, He that cometh unto me shall never thirst again. And he says here in, in St. John chapter 6, He that cometh unto me shall never hunger. And it's not just a one-time... I know I'm being redundant, but that's how you teach. In St. John chapter 7, which is the following chapter... The continuation of this party, Jesus again addresses this subject in St. John chapter 7, verse number 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, I'm quoting from the Bible, Jesus stood and cried and said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, our innermost being, shall flow rivers of living waters. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. When Jesus gives this account at this feast, the Holy Ghost was not given yet. Why was the Holy Ghost not given? Because Jesus said it himself. He was not glorified. He had not been to Calvary. He had not died on the cross. He was not buried for three days and rose on the third day. That was the glorification process. And the culmination of that glorification process is he was received back up into glory, but he sent the Holy Ghost back to us. Now, you cannot believe, according to this scripture, you cannot believe on the Lord any old way that you want to. And that's what the church world is teaching you today. Well, just believe. You can't believe on the Lord in any way that seems feasible to oneself. According to Jesus in this chapter 7, verses 37 through 39... The only salvific way of believing is as the scriptures say. You can't just say, well, I believe in God and you're saved. I know that they created that back in the days of Calvin, the great murderer that the church world loves today, that burned people at the stake in the name of Jesus. I don't find that anywhere in the Bible. I don't know why they made Calvin a hero. He's a murderer. Ooh, I'm saying it openly to all of you wonderful Protestants and all of you wonderful evangelicals. Get your nose in the book and get it out of all of the orthodox stuff and let's go back to believing the Bible. Let's go back to preaching salvation the way Jesus preached salvation. As the scripture has said. He that believeth on me as the scripture has said. One might declare, I'm a believer. Does that define one as being saved? Not according to Scripture. You have to believe as the Scripture has said. If just believing is all that is required to be saved, then the devil is saved. Nobody has to worry about the devil anymore. James 2.19 makes it very clear. He's a believer. The devil believes there's one God. In fact, he's had, he's had the stuff whooped out of him by that one God. Thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. So I guess we don't have any problems for the rest of this week. The devil is saved. The way some of you testify, you think he is. The devil has been chasing me all week. Bless his holy name. It's not blessed and it's not holy. And I'll tell you another chapter of that story. He ain't saved either. It's so like the old timer said, the devil's going to split hell wide open. In fact, the Bible says that hell is created for the devil and his angels. He's not saved. Just because you say you believe does not mean that you're saved. Bible belief is different than man's definition of believing. According to Jesus, when one believes as the scripture has instructed them to believe... A supernatural phenomenon occurs. I didn't say this. Jesus said this. He that believeth on me as the scripture has said, 
out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And what is he talking about? He makes it very clear. This spake he of the Spirit. They were going to receive the Holy Ghost when they believed the way that the Scripture said. That's why they went to Jerusalem and tarried there like Jesus commanded them to until they be endued with power from on high. Why did they stay in Jerusalem? To wait for the promise of the Father, Luke chapter 24, and fulfilled in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 2, where he commands them again in Acts chapter 1. Stay in Jerusalem, tarry there, but ye shall receive power when, verse number 8, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, and this spake he of the Spirit, which they should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet, because he had not completed Calvary's work and the resurrection work. So when we believe as the Bible has taught us to believe, an incredible phenomenon happens to us. The Holy Ghost begins to spring up out of us. Therefore with joy shall you draw water out of the wells. Isaiah chapter 12. Now this was puzzling to those who heard Jesus. But Jesus was speaking of one receiving the Holy Ghost. Which at this time had not yet been poured out because Jesus had not yet been glorified. And so there was no resurrected Christ at the time that Jesus declares this in St. John chapter 7. This was at the feast. The Holy Ghost could not come back to us until Christ was resurrected. This is made plain to us. And I've explained as far as I want to go this morning because I'm going another direction. But however, if you'll come back, I'll explain it. I'll explain it more clearly. Because I love this. I'm going to tell you something. The devil is doing his best to talk you out of the Holy Ghost while you're sitting there right now. He is doing his best. He is a master persuader. You don't need the Holy Ghost. Well, your grandma didn't have the Holy Ghost. How do you know? Your grandpa didn't have the Holy Ghost. How do you know? How do you know what they had? You know, I have a... There's Sister Garcia. I don't even know if she knows this. One day, I was talking to her daddy. I forgot his name. Jake. I'll never forget. We were at their house in Walsenburg. That was a long time ago. Well, a couple weeks. And there was a shade tree. It's like God branded it on my mind. Now there was, there is still many people around this area today that call themselves apostolic that believe in one God in Jesus' name, baptism, but they don't believe in receiving the Holy Ghost, the evidence of speaking in tongues. This is, this is some of the residue of the Protestant evangelical influence in their life. And my encouragement is to go back to being apostolic all the way. Why do we need the church world stuff? Now, I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying if you're going to be apostolic, be apostolic. If I was going to be Catholic, I'd be Catholic. But I'm not. I'm an apostolic. I don't have anything against Catholic people. I love them. But I'm going to try to talk them back. I'm going to do my best into talking in them into being Pentecostals. That's my job. That's what I'm doing with you right now. And I was talking with Brother... Garcia about the Holy Ghost I will never forget this as long as I live he said you see that tree right there or something I don't even know how he said it. but anyway he told me he said Pastor Elder I do believe in receiving the Holy Ghost and I said you do he said yes I didn't know him that well so I, I didn't have a judgment one way or another. 
and he told me the story. He said, I had a tree, and he had a little church. I don't even know if they still have that church building over there where he pastored. He took me and showed me that. And he said, I prayed under this tree. And he said, I was praying one afternoon. And he said, I began to weep uncontrollably. And he said, the Holy Ghost come on me, and I began to speak in tongues. And I spake in tongues, I don't know how long. But he said, I never talked about it because so many of the ministers looked down upon it. Now, why are you telling me this? Because you don't know what kind of encounters people have with God. The Bible says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And just because you didn't see it doesn't mean God doesn't do it. I'm going to tell you something. God works the night shift. God does a lot of work when you don't even know what's going on. Woo, I feel this. I said God does a whole lot of work when you don't even know what's going on. I could tell you story after story of people that are hungry because God honors hunger and thirst. But this was puzzling because they had never heard this. And the Holy Ghost had not been poured out because Jesus Christ had not been resurrected. And, and, and so... That is the added dimension to the Spirit of God is the resurrected power of Christ. It's another story altogether that's an awesome story. And I don't have time to deal with this in detail. However, if we had time, we could go to St. John chapter 14 where Jesus declares that he must go away, but he will not leave us orphans. Your English Bible says comfortless. But he said, I will come again to you. And he continues this discourse by notifying his disciples that he will send the Holy Ghost, which is the spirit of the resurrected Christ. How do we know this? Because Romans chapter 8, verse number 9 says, Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 11 talks about even the Old Testament prophets that prophesied by the spirit of Christ which was in them, which was the Holy Ghost. But it was not made perfect until the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came back as the paracletos or as the comforter. So that's what it means to believe on him as the scripture has says. Let's go a little further. Acts chapter 19 verse number 1 through 6. There were people that said they were believers. They were, I believe they were sincere. I believe they were honest. I don't discard the faith and the honesty of a lot of people. But let me remind you, you can be sincerely wrong while you're being sincere. And the Bible makes it very clear that the only way the well flows is to believe as the Scripture has said. Now, if you want to create your own form of religion, you go ahead. Man has done that for thousands of years. And look at the mess it's got us in today. Did you know that Christianity is declining in America? The only Christian faith in America that is growing is the Pentecostal faith. Don't take my word for it. Go look at the studies at Harvard and Yale and some of these other that have these sociological studies. Why is Pentecost growing? Because it's authentic. It's the real experience with Jesus Christ. Uh, it is the way that God designed for him to come back into humanity. I didn't say it. Jesus said, he that hungers and thirst. He, he that believeth on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And these believers were sincere. And Paul saw them and he said, well, your believers have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed. And they said, we not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. We didn't know about that. We were John the Baptist's disciples. And he said, well, John baptized done repentance. That's an important thing. But repentance is not the completion of the Holy Ghost and salvation. Repentance is the beginning. Repentance is just death. If all you do is repent, you're dead. You've got to be resurrected. And the Bible says that he preached unto them. And, and, and when he preached unto them, they believed. 
And Paul laid his hands on them and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues and prophesy. Now everywhere the church started, they were speaking in tongues and prophesying. Now why did the church start like that and it doesn't continue like that? And I know there's some fancy, there's some fancy pants, uh, uh, academia, theologians that have said tongues have ceased. There's not a scripture in the Bible that says tongues have ceased. They take that scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 out of context. He's not even talking about tongues. He's talking about love. In fact, in chapter 14, the apostle Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. So it's obvious that in chapter 13, he's not, about, he's not talking about tongues that have ceased. He's talking about love is the greatest power that God gave us. And you can't even get the love of God without the Holy Ghost. Because Romans chapter 5 says, and the love of God, the agape of God, that's the Greek word that everybody loves using. The agape of God is shed abroad in our hearts. How does it get shed? By the Holy Ghost. Man, if you think that we're going to deny the Holy Ghost, you come to the wrong place. Uh, we are tongue-talking, and we're not ashamed of it. We're full of the Holy Ghost, and we love it. Uh, that's why there's so much power around here. That's why there's so much faith. It's not by us. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. Why don't you let the Holy Ghost move in your praise right now? Woo! The Bible says in Acts chapter 19, they received the Holy Ghost, spake in tongues, and prophesied. And then Paul baptized them in Jesus' name. John chapter 7, 38 and 39, again, seems to indicate that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you have an artesian river that flows in you. And any time you're thirsty, you can go drink of that river. Now, you don't have to drink. I've had horses, and I know, I know, I know all of these old ranchers say, I can make a horse drink. Yeah, but you've got to give him something to make him drink. If a horse don't want to drink, he ain't going to drink, brother Bob. You know, you can feed him salt, or you can feed him dry grain. He probably won't eat that either. You ever seen a, ton, a, a horse... I gave my horse peanut butter one time. It was hilarious. <laughs> you don't realize how long that tongue is. <laughs> you can have the well. I read of a place in South America where they get over 100 inches of rain every year, and yet they continue to have a water supply problem in the village. It's on a mountaintop, and it all runs down. I know some Pentecostals that are like that. It's raining all the time and they're, and they're dry. You don't believe it? Watch them. They come to church. They never worship. They sit there like World War II army blankets draped over the back of the pew. Or, or this is them, the whole church service. I'm going to preach about that here in a minute. You know what Jeremiah said? My people, they have a lack of water because they've hewed them out cisterns that don't hold well. Anybody ever lived on cisterns? I've had plenty of opportunity to buy property that don't have a well. It just has a cistern. You know what, Brother Burton? I won't buy one. All that green scum and junk that's in those cisterns. Whoo! Son, there's new life in those cisterns. New bacteria. And so the Bible says that this artesian well flows out of them. Anytime you're thirsty, you can drink. You can have the well, but you may not be drinking. Anybody here today thirsty? I didn't come here to impress you with how I dress or how I sing. I'll be honest with you, I came here today because I needed Jesus. I need another drink. I want to get around some other people that feel like I do. I want to get around some people that have the same hunger and thirst that I have. You know that's why drug addicts hang out together? Because they have the same appetite. 
You know, that's why alcoholics go to the same bar, because they hook up with people that have the same thirst. You know, that's why I come to this church, because I'm looking for people that are hungry like I am. I'm looking for people that are thirsty like I am. Now, instead of drinking from this well that God wants to put in them, there is this, this tendency of humanity to drink from everywhere except for where God wants us to drink. You know, when you're traveling and you need water, you don't see this so much in America, but if you go with me to even Mexico, if you go with me out of the country, you better be careful where you drink. There have been places that I've went to in the world that I kept my mouth shut while I took a shower because the water coming out of those showers was so deadly that you didn't want it. I, that's hard for some of you to understand because you, you live such a cushy life. The poorest people in America are some of the wealth. Did you know that if you have a toilet in your house, you are in the top 20% of the people in the world? If you have a toilet in your house, 80% of the world does not even have a toilet. 80% of the world doesn't have a car. 80% of New York don't have a car. You think I'm jiving because you ain't ever been to New York. You want to park that car, it costs you $150 a day. Go ahead. So they all take the subway. And you get introduced to rats that are that long. Instead of drinking from this well, they have, Jeremiah said, they have hewn them out cisterns that won't hold water. And so Jesus was teaching this lady the important principle of trading a water source that could dry up for an artesian source that would never run dry. Now in some places in this account of Jesus and the woman at the well, I have read that there is another place that is near Jacob's well that is also called Jacob's well. I don't know. I've been there. I've been to the Samaritans, but I've not been to Jacob's well. And they tell me that Jacob's well is deep and the water is cold and it is fresh. But there's another place that's by there. I don't know if this is true or not. It's just what I've read. Where they call it Jacob's well and it's not a well. It's a cistern. And it can go dry. And that they depend on the rain to come and fill it up. I don't want to be dependent on every other source for my source of water, especially when Jesus said I could have a well springing up inside of me. Why am I going to other sources when Jesus said it will be inside of me? So in the same manner that even though the well is there in us, it is up to us to keep going back to drink. And then he gives this statement, come Brother Richard, I'm almost done. I am the bread of life, the sustenance of life. The sustenance of life. I am, I am the bread of life. And he says, he is there for us to partake of that bread. And in the same way that you don't just drink one time, you don't just eat one time. Now listen, brothers and sisters. Listen to me carefully. Eating and drinking is a personal thing. Sister Jada, what's your favorite food? Put her on the spot. Okay, what's your favorite Mexican food? Enchiladas. Ha. Ah, muy rico. Tejanas. Chile, Colorado. Tortillas homemade. (laughs) 
as much I could prepare Sister Jada's enchiladas exactly how she likes it. Perfectly how she likes it. And set it in front of her and she can look at that and tell me, Brother Elder, you did a fabulous job. Which would be a lie because I don't cook enchiladas real good. I'd have to order them from my favorite restaurant, which is the ladies in this church. I was skinny till I came to Pueblo, believe it or not. How she likes it, uh, a pollo or, or carne, beef or chicken. Here, and, and she can tell me, Brother Elder, this is beautiful. That is so awesome. It smells divine. Oh, it's, and she's dying. She's got to eat. She's got to eat. Eat, Sister Jada. No, I just want to look at it. I just want to talk about how good it is. I want to talk about how pretty it looks. I, I just want to come to church on Sunday morning and just talk about how great God is. No, you got to eat. I can't eat for you. I can prepare it. Jesus has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. Church is not a place that's a museum where we come and admire how beautiful the bread of life is. And how, how man, that cup that the, that the water is in, it's just beautiful. No, you're dying of hunger and thirst. You got to eat and drink. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body. Take, drink. This is my body. How much does he talk about the bread of life? How much does he talk about the water that you will never thirst again? But it's up to you and I to eat. If you don't eat, you're going to die. I wish I could eat for you, but I can't. I'm in the hospital all the time. And one of the biggest concerns when somebody's on the edge of death is how do we feed them? How do we hydrate them? I was talking to a doctor the other day and I said, uh, th this person's in a coma. And I said, can you just hook up an IV? And she said, no, we can, but it'll cause all kinds of problems. The, if, if, the, if the body's not working right, then, the, then it does not distribute. That's how powerful the blood is and the heart is. It's got to distribute that liquid in your body or it's stored up in your joints and it's stored up. And pretty soon it stores up around your heart. I feel the Holy Ghost and so the Holy Ghost is encouraging us to eat in fact it was so important there was one prophet Ezekiel that God told in Ezekiel chapter 3 he said take the whole row and eat the whole thing and Ezekiel said when I ate it it was sweet to the taste I'm telling you, the devil's lying to some of you. You think this old word of God is just outdated and it's old-fashioned. But I'm telling you, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. It's real good if you'll pick it up and eat it. And it's even further because Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. He was saying that he was the manna that came down. From heaven and they were cursing him for saying that and making fun of him and they don't even realize that he came to seek and to save them there's nothing more frustrating than to be a medical person or a spiritual person or a pastor or somebody and you're encouraging somebody here eat here eat this is what you need you'll start feeling better if you'll eat this You'll start feeling better if you'll drink this. If you drink this, your headache will go away. If you eat this, your depression will go away. If you receive this into your body, you quit having those cravings that causes the addiction. If you eat this. Look, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to impress you with how good I can preach this morning. I'm trying to preach to you this is the answer for your soul. Yeah. 
He said, I am the bread of life. 230 time, 239 times. The Bible speaks of bread in the Old Testament 70 times. In the New Testament. And I could get into all of that. But Jesus is talking about, I am that bread that came down from heaven. I am that that came from the very throne of God. When they were in the wilderness. And I, there's so much I can't preach this this morning. But it's interesting to note that no time in the 400 years of their bondage and the diet that they had in Egypt, bread was not a part of that diet. You can't find it in the Bible. You can find onions. You can find leeks. You can find fish. You know what leeks are? That's grass. Oh, man, I, that's what I want for Sunday afternoon dinners, grass. Well, you've got to be careful how you say that in Colorado. Four hundred years in Egypt. I don't find bread in Moab. It's not their diet. You're not going to find bread in the world. You're not going to find bread in Moab. Hey, Naomi, you got to get back to Bethlehem. Beth, Hebrew, house, Lehem. House of bread. If you're going to eat the bread that brings life. When you go to Moab, there's death, there's disease. When you go to Egypt, there's bondage. And even when they got to craving what they had in Egypt, they were not craving bread. They said, we want the leeks and onions of Egypt. There's no bread in Egypt. There's no bread in Moab. And they're wandering in the wilderness. Now, I love this. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 16, they went to bed one night and the next morning when they got up. I don't know how long I've been preaching. I'm, I'm almost done. But I feel like God telling me to preach this this morning. When they woke up, something had happened. The Bible says that behold the face of the wilderness, 16 and 14 of Exodus. Upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost of the ground. We're familiar with hoarfrost here in Colorado. We see it on the trees in the winter. It's beautiful. But it wasn't hoarfrost. It was bread. They didn't know what to call it, so they called it manna. Simply, what is it? I'll tell you what it is. It's bread from heaven. And Jesus said, I am that bread. Now look, bread from heaven. Look at this, brothers and sisters. Transported through the medium of the morning dew was before them. Day after day, this miraculous bread from heaven sustained them. Now think of this. This bread was produced by the God that had created the human body. He knew that the human body needed. He knew what it needed. The God of heaven knew that the human body could not produce vitamins in the body. And that the only way to acquire them is to receive them from the life-giving sustenance. So the God of heaven put that in that bread. He knew that the human body had to have seven major elements to survive and keep them healthy. So he put those seven major elements in that bread. Our great God knew all of this as he lovingly prepared this nutritious bread in the vats and the ovens of heaven. We know this because the Bible tells us that for the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness, they never were sick one time. In Exodus 15 and 26, uh, they didn't have to buy new shoes because some miraculous way, their body was preserved, their clothing was preserved, their health was preserved. Every time they ate that bread, it brought every sustenance that they needed. Every day picking up that bread, they didn't even realize it. They were just going after the taste. But there's got to be more to the bread than just the taste. There's got to be the sustenance. Uh, there's got to be the health. Uh, I want to tell you, we need to get off our taste kick, brothers and sisters. And we need to realize what's good for the soul. The Bible says that the, he gave them the desires of their heart, but their soul was lean. 
was lean. Lean. And so we have people today, they're making tons of money, but they're empty. Oh yeah, they just did a, a Pew report come out in 2022. Said America is the most unhappy they've ever been in the history of this nation. But we got more money than we've ever had. We got better cars. If you don't believe it, ask the politicians. They're always trying to change our cars for us. We've got more than we've ever had. We got more games than we've ever had. And here's what the Bible says that they said. We hate this bread. We hate this bread. We don't want any more of this bread. Moses, speak to God and give us something else. We don't want this bread. So we've replaced the word of God with iPhones and iPads and emails. And What's the new thing that came out on Facebook? Threads. And so Mark Zuckerberg is getting, getting sued by, uh, uh, what's the guy that owns Twitter? Elon Musk. Anybody reading about any of this? Elon Musk is suing Mike Zuckerberg because he stole his idea of threads. And not only that, he stole a bunch of the, uh, he stole a bunch of the executives from Twitter. And now they're building a second Twitter and they're calling it Facebook. So we're finding new ways to eat bread that doesn't come from heaven. We're finding new ways. Now it's quiet in here. And, and all of you are so busy. But I have to deal with it every day. I have to deal with it every day. In fact, America's becoming like water buffalo. Not only America, but the world is becoming like water buffalo. We expect that the predators are going to take a certain percentage of us out. So we just shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well, oh, well. I don't feel that way. God didn't make me a water buffalo. I'm from the lion of the tribe of Judah. I still got some fight in me. You can be a water buffalo all you want to. And just sit there and bray when the enemy comes on you. But I'll tell you this, if you'll eat this bread from heaven, it'll put some fight in you. It'll put some resistance in you. I'll tell you what we need. We need a diet of this bread from heaven that's got the genetics of our Father, our King, and our God. Give us the bread from heaven. Oh, let's stand to our feet this morning. Bread, bread. Now, again, you got to qualify everything. If, if, if you're allergic to gluten, God bless you. But for crying out loud, if you're allergic to gluten, eat cornbread. Eat rye. Pumpernickel. You just, now, some of you, you, you don't realize this, but when you go to Israel, the main staple of their diet today is bread bread they eat bread for everything they eat bread for breakfast they eat bread for lunch they eat bread for supper they eat bread for a midnight snack there's bakeries everywhere you ever heard of bagels guess where those come from Jewish people I love bagels I love Einstein bagels guess where that name comes from Einstein think about it Shouldn't take you long. Bread. Bread. Healthy bread. I know the world says it's not healthy for you. How many other lies are you going to believe the world has told you? And they're, and they're telling you today, you don't need church. Well, let's see. Let's see how long people can live without church. But I'll tell you this, when they come to church, they need the bread from heaven. They don't need some little opinion of somebody. They don't need to know about some current event that's happening over in 
Antarctica with the penguins and the whales having a big squabble. You know why men do that? Because they don't go spend time with God. And I'll tell you this. I'm even careful. Brother Mitchell, I'm preaching all of us right now. I'm even careful about series. Because series is an easy way of not having to go get the bread. Oh, I, I understand. I understand. I do them. You know I do them. But I'm going to tell you something. There is the rhema word of God, the right now bread that comes down from heaven that we have to eat it right now. Because we're in this journey and we're running as hard as we can run. And the enemy's after us and we lay down and we're tired. And an angel taps us on the shoulder and says, hey, hey, wake up and eat this bread. And when you wake up and you eat that bread, uh, then all of a sudden the power of God comes on you. And you're, that's what happens. We go to these meetings like double portion and the man of God preaches and you feel still the strength. Feel the strength and the residue of that bread that came from double portion because that's bread from heaven. That's bread from heaven. The Word of God is powerful. It's quick. It's glorious. And even, and I close with this, even the, even the prodigal in the hog pen looking at the you know, hogs in America today are so spoiled. When I was a kid growing up, guess what we fed the hogs? Slop. Slop was everything. All of your old clothes you didn't want, you threw it in slop. They eat it. I'm not exaggerating, they eat it. Did you know the mob used to take the people that they killed and they'd throw them in hog pens? Because the pigs would eat them. Get rid of the evidence. Did you know that pigs are a type of unclean spirits? You can hang out with the hogs all you want to, brothers and sisters. I'm getting out of the hog pen. Because hogs eat unclean stuff. Whew. And what in the world is a child of God doing in a hog pen anyway? Why are you in a hog pen on Sunday afternoon and stood in the church house? Why are you in the hog pen on Sunday and stood in the house of your father? Why are you down here in a hog pen on a Sunday afternoon or a Sunday morning and your soul is lean and you're starving? You are starving to death. Uh, you might as well do what this man did, this prodigal son. The Bible says when he came to himself, he said, even the servants in my father's house have bread. They have more bread to spare, and I perish with hunger. I'm preaching to you this morning. You're in the house of bread. You're here where the bread of heaven comes down. You're here where there's forgiveness of sin. You're here where there's deliverance. You're in the house where there's healing. You can be set free from drug addiction. You can be set free from sexual addictions. You can be set free from depression. You, there's bread enough in here. There's bread in this house. Uh, he'll put your marriage back together. He'll bring your wayward children back to you. He'll do it. Come and dine. Come and dine. Come and dine. Come and eat the bread. Come and drink the water. It's here. It's here. It's in this altar. Woo. Feel the Holy Ghost this morning. Hallelujah. 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 Woo! Talking about bread. Wally just texted me. I'm up here at Penrose Hospital and DJ is showing big signs of recovery. He's awake. He moves his hands. He's following commands. He's even trying to talk. It's what the bread does, brothers and sisters. It's what the bread does. It's how it'll help you. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How do I do this? I, you just lift your hands. Begin to talk to your father. His bread will come in your life.
father's house there's more than you'll ever eat Woo! come on let's worship him come on let that water flow let that river flow Eat the bread, drink the water.
singing if you know it. And I, I'm desperate for you. Our world needs this bread. Our world needs this water. where animals have been rent and torn by other animals. And they know instinctively as those wounds begin to fester and begin to become more and more infected, those animals will go into the, the creeks and the lakes and they'll just lay there and they'll let that water, they'll just let that water wash over that wound and clean that infection out clean that festering out and sometimes we get in a hurry when we come to church and we gotta hurry up and get this done we got stuff to do, no it's alright to lay in this altar and just let the washing the Bible says not by works of righteousness which we have done but by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. You know what some of us need? We don't need another quick trip out to somewhere today. We need some time spent in the presence of God. Let our Father wash over us. Feed us the bread of life. Oh, let's lift our hands and let's worship Him. Hallelujah. God's doing some special things in this city, brothers and sisters. I said God is doing some special things in this city. Come on, I need some people that'll help me praise him. Who will help me praise him? Can you help me praise him right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ilaba shandala la boko shatala la morie yolororo boho shatai. It's okay to talk in tongues. It's okay. It's okay to let the Holy Ghost flow in your life. It's okay. Let the word of God the cleansing power of the word of God, cleansing power of his blood, the water of the spirit. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you are a guest here today, we're so grateful that you came to be with us at Christian Growth Center. We are always wanting you to feel the liberty of the Holy Ghost here to receive whatever you need to receive it's our effort to create an environment of faith where you can believe God and he can move and do what is needed in all of our lives amen praise God there is Spanish outreach service this afternoon at 2.30 and God's going to be moving in a very very powerful way at our Spanish outreach service 2.30 this afternoon hallelujah if you don't have anything else to do this afternoon, come and join us. Say, I don't speak Spanish. Well, many of them come to our English-speaking service, so we can honor them by going to the Spanish-speaking service. Hallelujah. Besides, you never know when they'll break out the tacos. Praise God. And I'm, I'm excited about what God is doing in our Spanish-speaking families. Praise God. Tonight at 6 o'clock, service will be right here. 5.30 prayer, choir practice, 4.30. You don't want to miss it. God's going to be moving in a mighty way. Love one another. You are dismissed.